Harvard Divinity School. Goethe's Biological Misfits, Palm Fetish, Monstrous Rose, and Competitive Barnacle, November 13th, 2024. Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Rachel Peterson, and I lead the Thinking with Plants and Fungi initiative here at the Center for the Study of World Religions. And on behalf of the initiative, welcome and thank you. For those of you who are new to our work, we are an interdisciplinary exploration into the way that cutting edge plant science is troubling our notions of mind and matter and humans' relationship to the more than human world. Um, we offer a range of programming, including guest lectures, a reading group. This is actually our last official offering of this semester, but I do want to ask all of you to mark your calendars for May 15th to 17th of next spring, which will be our big conference with some really incredible keynoters. And we just closed our call for submissions for papers, and we received over 240 submissions. So it's going to be a really exciting and dynamic conference, and I hope you all can make it. I'd like to welcome you to this lecture in particular, which I'm really excited about. Note that the title and the topic have shifted slightly um, to Goethe's Botanical Misfits, The Fetishistic Plant, Monstrous Rose, and Endless Root. But fear not, we will retain the focus of Goethe, and perhaps we can coax Professor Carranza to speak on Agnes Arbor at a later date. So Johann Wolfgang von Goethe is a difficult figure to characterize. He is often remembered as a novelist, dramatist, philosopher, and poet. However, he was also, I'm sure as most of you know, a prolific scientist. He dedicated years to the study of optics, culminating in the theory of colors, which refuted Newton's physics of light. His work on plant and animal morphology has had a lasting influence on the field of biology. Indeed, Goethe's work informed and is referenced by Darwin's in the, uh, on, the, on the origin of species. But Goethe was not a scientist in the way we popularly imagine today. A true German Gelehrte, he read voraciously, traveled widely, and believed that knowledge achieved its fullest expression through a holistic synthesis of disciplines. People forget, he lamented, that science developed from poetry, and they fail to take into consideration that a swing of the pendulum might bene beneficially reunite the two at a higher level and to a mutual advantage. Plants arguably proved to be the subject in which Goethe most clearly merged his poetic, philosophical, and empirical sensibilities. He de dedicated many years to the study of plants, meticulously observing their shapes, movements, and functions. He felt disillusioned by the dominant Linnaean taxonomy of his time, which classified organisms based on atomized parts. In contrast, he developed a theory that all plant structures evolved from a single archetypal form, which he famously deemed die Urpflanze, through the process of metamorphosis, positing a kind of wholeness or unity in multiplicity. Upon his return to Germany, Goethe elaborated his botanical theory in The Metamorphosis of Plants, published in 1790, which would go on to influence botany in lasting ways. In discussing Goethe's morphology, it is easy to focus on the idealized, abstracted Urpflanze, losing sight of the very specific specimens that inspired his theory. Goethe would perhaps balk at this erasure, not only on account of the painstaking years he passed observing specific plants, but more fundamentally for Goethe, multiplicity and unity ride side saddle in nature. Any argument for nature's wholeness must also account for the singular instances of its unruliness, the strange aberrations and abominations whose pluriform weirdness repudiates our simplest abstractions. In other words, any account of nature must also account for misfits, which is why I'm very excited to welcome Professor Carranza, whose talk today will focus on the misfit specimens that influenced Goethe. And I would like to invite my colleague, Jack Brooks, to introduce Professor Carranza. Jack is a third year MDiv student, a Goethe admirer, a Goethe reader, and was an invaluable part of our exploration of Goethe last year in the Thinking with Plants and Fungi reading group. I'm so happy to have him here today. Welcome, Jack. Professor Daniel Carranza is an assistant professor of Germanic languages and literatures at Harvard University. He studied German literature and philosophy in Portland, Tübingen, Chicago and Leipzig. He received his master's and PhD from the University of Chicago 
and fellowships from the Fulbright and Humboldt Foundations. His research and teaching interests include 18th to 20th century German literature, poetics and the history of the lyric, the German philosophical tradition from Kant to Heidegger, moments of cross-pollination between the history of science and the history of philology, new formalisms and literary theory. <clears throat> he perpetually returns to the question of how poetry thinks. He also serves as the German studies director for the Society of German Idealism and Romanticism. Please welcome Professor Carranza. Thank you for the lovely introductions. It's wonderful to venture out of the German department to the Div School and to share with you some ongoing work on Goethe's natural science. Um, I'm very excited about the cross-pollinations that will emerge by presenting to this audience at the Div School. Um, as you can see, the talk has changed. Uh, Hegel plays but he, he does make an appearance at the very beginning. So in 1812, Goethe began reading the Swiss physician philosopher Ignaz Paul Vital Troxler's Insights into the Essence of the Human Being, published that same year. Before even reaching the book's introduction, however, irritation set in. The book was prefaced with an epigraph here on the right drawn from Hegel's own preface to the phenomenology of spirit. At the very beginning of Hegel's preface, the philosopher argues that the history of philosophical systems can be read as a progressive evolution of standpoints that Janus faced point backwards to the imminent contradictions of their predecessors at the same time that they become more progressively articulate in their formulation of such conceptual problems. Hegel wrote, the bud disappears when the blossom breaks through, and we might say that the former is refuted by the latter. In the same way, when the fruit comes, the blossom may be explained to be a false form of the plant's existence, for the fruit appears as its true nature in place of the blossom. These stages are not merely differentiated, they supplant one another as being mutually incompatible. But the ceaseless activity of their own inherent nature makes them at the same time moments of an organic unity, where they not merely do not contradict one another, but where one is as necessary as the other. And all this equal necessity of moments constitutes alone and thereby the life of the whole. In the early 1800s, Troxler had studied philosophy under Hegel in Jena, and the motto can thus be read as an innocent enough homage to his former teacher. For Goethe, however, this passage, which he mistakenly identified as drawn from Hegel's logic, was nothing less than scandalous. In a letter to the physicist Thomas Johann Seebeck, Goethe vented his frustration. It is hardly possible to say anything more monstrous. To want to destroy the eternal reality of nature with a bad, sophistic joke seems to me to be quite unworthy of a reasonable man. Hegel's naturalizing simile for Goethe had made a joke of a tremendous process of nature, in his words, corrupting and destroying it by artfully self-contradicting words and phrases. A year later, on January 15, 1813, Goethe read Zebeck's explanation that Hegel was not concerned with real plants at all, but rather with an abstract point about viewing the history of philosophy as a progressively evolving organic unity. By my eyes, Goethe replied, Hegel is absolved. In German, Hegel ist bei mir entzündet. Goethe replied to Zebeck, remarking that the original context of the passage neutralizes its meaning. Even though he takes Troxler to task for quoting Hegel out of context, Goethe nonetheless emphasizes that Hegel should have put his sentence in the conjunctive. If he had expressed this simile, which refers to the metamorphosis of plants in the subjunctive, it would be immediately clear that he only draws on it conditionally for his purpose, which is entirely permissible for any speaker. 
Goethe read Hegel's language of organic unity not conceptually, which is what Hegel meant, but figuratively, seeing it as imposing nature or a natural form onto the history of philosophy. An irritation for someone who had devoted so much time in Italy and after to the empirical observation of botanical specimens. It was in Italy between 1786 and 1788, after all, that Goethe struck upon the idea of the Urplant, which would bring a flexible, labile order to the Linnaean system of endlessly proliferating nomenclature. Linnaean taxonomy for Goethe was akin to a kind of mosaic, as he put it, that overlaid a static discursive grid over um, the fluctuating and protean surface of the vegetating earth with its many taxonomic designations. Rather than empirically correlate observable traits to a general category, Goethe sought to understand plants in terms of a universal type, the urplant, which was not empirically observable, but rather a conceptually generative normative idea. As he put it, with this model and the key to it, one can even invent plants into infinity, which must be logically consequential. That is, even if they do not exist, they nevertheless could. Rather than merely naming nature's diverse flora, Goethe sought to apprehend with his mind's eye the inner lawfulness of expansion and contraction of the transcendental leaf that govern their biological diversity even allowing the morphological observer to propose hypothetical plant formations, even species, that are logically possible, even if empirically non-actual. A philosophical line of reading inaugurated by Eckhart Furster's study, The 25 Years of Philosophy, has read Goethe's natural science as a neo-Spinozist scientia intuitiva. This diagram of the plant's progressive expansion and contraction of the leaf is drawn from that book. But in this talk, for the purposes of this audience at the Divinity School devoted to plant consciousness and new approaches to the vegetal realm, I'd like to shift perspective and not look at, again, Goethe's concept of the plant as the transcendental leaf or urpflanze, but rather at empirical plant specimens Goethe worked with. This shift allows us to capture aspects of Goethe's botany and natural science more generally that are distinctly heterodox, not only with regard to our contemporary notions of empirical quantitative scientific inquiry, but also with regard to the philosophically idealist intellectual milieu in which he was working. It was a specific plant that Goethe observed in the botanical garden of Padua in 1786 that allowed him to strike upon and receive confirmation of his intuition that all is leaf. The Mediterranean fan palm planted in Padua in 1585 and still there to this day. This is a photograph of the same palm tree Goethe observed. It grows or sustains itself to this day. This palm is not quite Goethe's primordial plant, which, through conversations with Schiller, he later concluded was non-empirical, but rather occasions the primordial scene of his botanical endeavors, thus not an Urpflanze, but an Urzene of its conception. A fan palm tree captured my full attention. Luckily, the simple, spear-shaped first leaves were still on the ground, and their successive separation increased until finally the fan-like shape was fully formed. From a simtar-like sheath, a little branch with flowers emerged and appeared as a strange outcome, standing in no relation to the precedent growth, alien and surprising. Here, you see the emergent little branch with flowers, and in this drawing from the Linnaean Society of London, 1815, I believe, you can better observe the simtar-like sheath on the left, out of which the flowering of the plant palm branches emerges. As Goethe continues, at my request, the gardener cut off all the sequential stages of these changes for me, and I took some large pieces of cardboard to carry this discovery. They are still lying in front of me as I took them back with me then, still safe and sound, and I honor them as fetishes that seem to attract and capture my attention perfectly, promising me a fruitful sequence of my efforts. 
Goethe's palm specimens hauled back to dreary Weimar from Padua were a scientific fetish. The word does not have the semantic historical sense of erotic deviancy yet. Rather, in Goethe's usage, the fetish marks a concrete natural specimen that exemplifies an otherwise rare and unobservable natural lawfulness, precisely insofar as it deviates from that lawfulness. In the Padua palm, Goethe found a fetishistic embodiment of what he elsewhere terms Steigerung, or intensification, the emergence of an utterly alien and strange form in miraculous and apparent discontinuity from its previous stages of formative development. The specimen testifies for Goethe to how vegetal forms are not originally determined and fixed, as he puts it, but rather characterized by a fortunate mobility and flexibility. But Goethe's palm fetish functions as more than a specimen of botanical complexity emerging discontinuously from previous formation. If we examine Goethe's language, we observe a repetition and thus parallelization of the word Stufenfolge dieser Veränderungen, or series of these changes in the palm, with the gedeihliche Folge meiner Bemühungen, the prosperous series of my botanical endeavors, or the fruitful sequence of my attempts. Goethe here aligns the palm's apparent vegetal discontinuity of form amidst the continuity of growth with the promise that his own potentially discontinuous, interrupted scientific endeavors will nonetheless take developmental shape and emerge intensified into a scientific insight such as that of the ur plant. Goethe's palm fetish thus materializes a vegetal developmental discontinuity in such a way that emblematically visualizes the very discontinuity of sudden scientific insight. Goethe's scientific fetish furthermore has a memorial function. The palm specimen commemorates a moment in the observer's own personal scientific investigation, fusing the inspired surprise of epistemic discovery with the discovered phenomenon to be explained, intermingling and even congealing materially observed and observer in an object or specimen so as to operate in future times of academic despair as a kind of consoling fetish object. As an objectification that preserves the idiosyncratic, contingent personal history of scientific observation, the palm fetish thus not only epistemically functions to demonstrate nature's formative rule in an exemplary exception, but furthermore provides a kind of scientific consolation to the observer, insofar as it materially crystallizes and thereby preserves the otherwise fleeting moment of discovery, of recognizing and seeing the norm in the abnormal. In invoking the fetish for the purposes of his natural scientific observational praxis, Goethe was subverting an Enlightenment discourse about the origins of religious sentiment and irrational superstition. The term fetish was disseminated into Germany by Charles de Brosse's 1760 on the worship of fetish gods, or a parallel of the ancient religion of Egypt with the present religion of Nigritia, which was translated into German in 1785. The term derives etymologically from the Portuguese word fetichiao, or magical spell, folk superstition, ultimately related to the Latin factitius, or artificial, from facere, or to make. As William Peetz has shown, the term originated from the cross-cultural encounter between European merchants and tribes on the coast of West Africa during the 16th and 17th centuries, a concept elaborated to demonize the supposedly arbitrary attachment of West Africans to material objects. De Brosse's treatise defined the fetish as divinized objects of worship and expanded its scope to include not just artifacts revered as agential gods, but, quote, things endowed with a divine virtue, virtus or power, oracles, amulets, and protective talismans, end quote. 
De Brosse's work was derided in his day as having plagiarized Hume's Natural History of Religion from 1757, which was circulating already around 1740 in manuscript form in Paris, and which de Brosse's would have been turned on to by Diderot. A key difference between Hume's and de Brosse's accounts of religion's natural history, however, lied in de Brosse's introduction of the very term fetish and fetishism. For while Hume had naturalistically explained away polytheistic belief as the positing of independent immaterial powers or gods, de Brosse's proposed that particular material objects were themselves viewed as endowed with visible divine powers. The concept of the fetish would undergo a delimitation, a semantic delimitation, in the course of the 18th and 19th centuries. Already de Brosse's comparison of the fetishistic cult practices of contemporary Guinea tribes to the rituals of ancient Egyptian animal worship were considered scandalous, as it threatened to reframe even ancient Greek myth and rite in a materialist historicist account that robbed it of its historical uniqueness as a Western civilizational origin. Eventually, what was a concept used to justify colonial mercantile extraction over against the so-called primitives would become an Enlightenment discursive tool to protest against all religious and superstitious practices deemed irrational. As Peetz has shown, the Protestant merchants in Guinea would later set the groundwork for theological critiques of Roman Catholic practices, such as the worship of relics, like a saint's finger or skull, as primitively fetishistic in their veneration of a material object. By the time we get to Kant's 1793, Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone, any mere observance of statutory laws for their own sake in a religion, which for Kant was most prominent in Judaism and Islam, was deemed to, quote, transform the service of God into a mere fetishism, for the striving for a good life conduct on its own terms, rather than the blind obedience to rules that might please God simply because he dictated them, should be the inner purpose guiding religious conduct for Kant. As Kant concludes this passage, it is in this distinction that true enlightenment consists, though it does the service through it, does the service of God for the first time become a free and hence moral cult. Peetz described the creation of a fetish as the attribution of purposefulness to some object contingently associated with a desired goal which subsequently entailed the abject submission of subjective autonomy in reified ritual obedience to the arbitrary imaginative dictates of a material thing or event. Goethe's palm fetish, we might say, invested the botanical specimen with the desired goal of epistemic discovery, entailing the scientific observer's own reified ritual obedience to what Goethe considered the lawful, eternal dictates of nature itself in its ongoing, often inscrutable, naturing as natura naturans. The journey of scientific insight for Goethe thus made room for and even required ritualized object reverence that resisted being rationalized away and thus discarded. Goethe never threw away the specimen from Padua, but rather adapted and so covertly critiqued an Enlightenment discourse of fetishism that would rationalize away the revelatory character of scientific insight that no observer of nature can autonomously control or predict. Goethe's practice of morphological observation thus carved out an anti-enlightenment space for ritual or quasi-ritual observance, for the moment of heteronymous insight that intermingles observer and observed in, a, in an objectified fetish specimen. Looking back on his 1790 essay on the metamorphosis of plants in 1819, Goethe realized how much he left unaccounted. In the late essay, Reworkings and Collections, he reflects in particular on what it even means for vegetal nature to evince natural laws in the first place. How does this discourse of laws and lawfulness move from society to nature? In this, concept, in this context, he recalls the example of the proliferated rose. 
which this is his own drawing in watercolor, which does not end with its blossom, but proceeds to develop a further stem and even flower. Goethe notes that the durchgewachsene, or grown through rose, as he calls it in German, is malformed because the beautiful shape of the rose is lost and the lawful limitation let loose. Despite this abnormal malformation, however, the rose only thereby increases in aesthetic beauty, achieving what Goethe calls a different perfection. What Goethe sees in the proliferated rose is nature's transgression of its own lawful limits. Nature transgresses the boundary that it has posited for itself. As he did with the term fetish, here Goethe introduces not a novel but an ancient word. The ancients used the words terras, prodigium, monstrum, a miracle, or wunderzeichen when referring to such meaningful specimens worthy of attention. As Lorraine Daston has shown, prodigies, monsters, and miracles, or omens, belong to a pre-modern scientific imaginary, especially prevalent in the 15th and 16th centuries. Natural and supernatural, often divine causes, were not mutually exclusive at this time, but in such natural wonders and monsters, inexplicably imbricated with one another. Neither purely supernatural or above nature, such as angels, nor unnatural, against nature, such as acts of incest or patricide, such monstrous natural specimens or events were considered preternatural or beyond nature. As Daston puts this, outside the quotidian order of nature, but still due to natural causes, however concatenated. Such prodigious monstrous births were taken as harbingers of divine retribution in response to human sin and had a unique semiotic temporality, pointing backwards to the past sin, always of a collective or even political nature, and forwards to the impending divine punishment, such as a flood or socio-political upheaval. Daston shows how the 1500s were a particularly fertile time for monsters because of God's righteous indignation against Protestant heretics, or vice versa. It is about this historical context that Abi Warburg wrote his 1920 essay, Pagan Antique Prophecy in Words and Images in the Age of Luther, devoting particular attention to divergent depictions of the Lanzer miracle pig, born in Zundgau in 1496, and reputed to possess one head, yet two bodies and eight feet. Sebastian Brandt depicted the monstrous so here on the top left, in a pamphlet published in 1496 dedicated to Kaiser Maximilian I, and interpreted the monstrous birth as a fortunate sign in support of Maximilian's political po prophecies. For Warburg, Brandt's woodcut interprets the so as a natural portent, allowing ancient Roman arts of superstitious divination to live on in an afterlife and travel via Etruria and Babylon back to Western Europe. As he terms this, the pamphlet attests to an inner, primevally human compulsion to attribute mythological causality not only to such monstrous births, but to the images themselves that depict them. Warburg goes on to argue that, unlike Brandt's image, Dürer's image, without accompanying interpretive text, is not politically instrumentalized as a supernatural sign that means beyond its own monstrous physicality. Rather, Dürer's depiction is driven by a natural scientific interest, or proto-scientific interest, in the so as a concrete creature. For Warburg, Dürer's realism thereby neutralizes the animal's preternatural power to influence the future, stripping the image of its potential phobic agency. As Warburg puts this, the natural scientific interest in the phenomenon drives the engraver. Dürer's print, as read by Warburg, presages how, in the course of the early 18th century, natural monstrosity will no longer be viewed as preternatural but undergo full naturalization. Natural monstrosity comes, rather, to be associated with nature's deviation from its own imminent regularities, precisely what Goethe had claimed on behalf of the proliferated rose.
As the Anglo-Irish natural philosopher Robert Boyle claimed in his free inquiry into the vulgarly received notion of nature from 1686, writing almost 200 years after Dürer, when monsters are said to be preternatural things, the expression is to be understood with regard to that particular species of bodies from which the monster does enormously deviate through the causes that produce, though the causes that produce that deviation act but according to general laws whereby things corporeal are guided. Having undergone a decoupling of natural creation from divine creator, monsters lost their portentous semiotic function and came to be viewed as natural anomalies that shed light on nature's otherwise normal regularities. By the time of naturalist Etienne Geoffrey Saint-Hilaire, writes the encyclopedia entry for Monstre in the 1827 Dictionnaire Classique d'Histoire Naturelle, monsters are but an ancient superstitious synonym for natural anomalies. When his son Isidore writes his general and particular history of organizational anomalies in man and animals, the first volume of which was released in 1832, the same year of Goethe's death, monstrosity will come to be finally overtaken and subsumed by the category of anomaly. Isidore taxonomizes natural anomaly into four types, varieties or non-deformed variations, structural defects or simple deformities that inhibit a physiological function, heterotaxy, meaning more complex anomalies that do not, however, impede function and are not even visibly apparent, and finally, monstrosities, the most complex kind of anomaly that is empirically visible and greatly interferes with physiological function. Monstrosity has here shifted into deviant pathology. Between Robert Boyle in 1686 and Geoffrey Saint-Hilaire in 1832, Goethe in 1819 deems the proliferating rose as both a natural anomaly and a monstrum, a Latin term, of course, related to the notion of demonstratio, or evidentiary, hypervisible, possibly monstrous demonstration. Between the pre-modern science of the preternatural and the modern science of natural anomalies as statistical divergences from regular, i.e. average, tendency and pattern, Goethe occupies an epistemological threshold when he contemplates this rose, pointing retrospectively as well as prospectively in the history of science. The French philosopher of science, Georges Canguillem, has noted that there is no, quote, special science of chemical or physical anomalies, arguing that there is a uniquely vital normativity to biology. As he explains, quote, the scientist, from his objective point of view, wants to see the anomaly as a mere statistical divergence, ignoring the fact that the biologist's scientific interest was first stimulated by the normative divergence. It is not paradoxical to say, so Kang Guillem, that the abnormal, while logically second to the normal, is existentially first. One of the philosophy of science's key insights is that exemplary deviations from natural laws always shed more light on the rule from which they deviate than straightforward examples. It is precisely the anomalous character of the exception to the rule that exceeds exemplification of the rule and so adds something new to its comprehension that a straightforward example of its exercise would not. Think, for example, of psychiatric or medical case studies. The case study is only truly informative of the norm by virtue of its abnormalities. For Goethe, however, this epistemic asymmetry between exception and rule, deviation and natural law, anomaly and normal regularity does not hold. The anomaly does not allow itself to be statistically averaged out or simply relegated to the realm of environmental contingency, a kind of statistical noise. As Goethe writes right before invoking his monstrously proliferating rose in a passage worth quoting in full, 
nature forms normally when it gives the rule to innumerable particulars, determining and conditioning them. But phenomena are abnormal when particulars prevail and stand out in an arbitrary, even seemingly random way. But because the two are closely related, and both the regulated and the irregular, literally what is without rule, are animated by one spirit, there arises a state of flux between the normal and the abnormal. Because formation and transformation are always alternating so that the abnormal seems to become normal and the normal abnormal. Of note here is that Goethe avoids the explanation of contingency with his qualification seemingly random, resists the step into fully modern statistical randomness as an explanance. Furthermore, the invocation of the one spirit that animates nature, the article one is capitalized in the original German, belies his pre-modern commitment to a Spinozist notion of nature actively naturing, even or especially in its exceptions to its own rules. At the same time, such exceptions are not preternatural as they were for Brandt and less so for Dürer, but fully naturalized. In place, of an epistemic asymmetry then between exception and rule, Goethe intuits a radical symmetry that systematically blurs the very categories of pre-statistical normative law of nature and abnormal deviation. When nature transgresses its own posited lawful limits, it rather achieves for him a greater perfection, namely an aesthetic surplus. The proliferating rose cannot help but be beautiful, and beautiful specifically to us, human beings. It is this aesthetic beauty of nature when it abnormally, exceptionally, deviantly transgresses its own natural laws that is uniquely Goethean in his natural science. The morphological observer of nature remains ensconced within that which she attempts to observe. Nature's transgressive deviations belie the existence of this human embeddedness within the observed in the act of observing, even materially congealing together with it in such specimen fetishes as Goethe's palm fronds from Padua. To what epistemic ends, however, does Goethe actually mobilize these pre-modern concepts such as the fetish or the monster? Goethe's remarks on the organization of parts within, anim within organic wholes in other essays suggest that the morphological observer may operate with the part-whole distinction as a heuristic tool rather than an ontological designation, a means of framing a vital phenomenon in order to render it more intelligible. This becomes apparent in the least likely of places, Goethe's frequent contemplation of the animal as a world unto itself. In the 1795 first draft of, um, of a general introduction to comparative anatomy based on osteology, Goethe claims, quote, we think of the closed animal as a small world that exists through itself and for its own sake, end quote. This draws on Kant's notion of the organism's internal purposiveness, the idea that an organism's parts are both cause and effect of one another in a reciprocal co-determination, a nexus finalis rather than nexus effectivus, such that they organize themselves into a whole and can only be understood with reference to this self-organizing whole, the unifying concept of which, termed a natural purpose, the organism itself imminently contains. Goethe is willing to drop such idealist philosophical commitments, however, when confronted with a living being in its phenomenal multiplicity. In the dazzling 1823 essay on barnacles, the Lepas, Goethe begins by pluralizing the organism in question, taking its parts as individual wholes in order to do justice to the unique living being before him. Every bivalved mosque that separates itself from the rest of the world can be regarded as an individual. Goethe is careful to qualify this by remarking that one sees here not an isolated being, but a multiplicity connected to a stalk or tube. 
Unlike higher animals, such as ma mammals then, barnacles are both one organism and a community of organisms. As Goethe puts it, even each individual shell forms a plurality, a mehrheit. Drawing on an essay by Gustav Karus, as well as actual specimens brought from Jena, Goethe juxtaposes Lepas anatifera, the goose barnacle you see here, with Lepas polyceps, the duck valve in German, Entenmuschel, to sketch two opposed forms of self-organization. The first regular, symmetrical, and predetermined or pre-stabilized, as he terms it. The second irregular, asymmetrical, and open-ended by virtue of being internally antagonistic. Unlike the goose barnacle, which grows exactly five shells in regularly spaced intervals, the lepas polyceps will develop as many shells as it can, vigorously multiplying and varying itself until it runs out of free space. One can observe the traces of this potentially infinite productivity in the little points that indicate potential shell formations on the barnacle stem. These points, however, says Goethe, are only shells in potentia, which do not achieve actualization, though they remain in possession of what he calls a drive to become actual, should more space present itself for their growth. Goethe here wonders at the exuberant vital activity of the irregular barnacle. Here we admire the busyness of nature to supplant the lack of sufficient power with a measure of activity. Lepas polyceps persists despite insufficient space and a lack of force, such that the main points of shell becoming, Hauptpunkte der Schallwerdung, form a kind of tiny string of pearls around the limit of expansion. Where then all trespass out of potentiality into actuality remains completely denied, so Goethe. Even when its self-realization is inexorably hindered and futile, the busyness of nature leaves behind visible traces of potential activity or regular growth. Remarkably, Goethe claims that the barnacle space for growth is not insufficient simply due to external environmental factors, but due to an internal strife, a competitive pressure exerted by each potential shell. As he writes, here, on closer inspection, it seems as if each shell point, shall punct, hurries to consume the next, to enlarge itself at their expense, at the moment before they reach becoming. Once in existence, however, even the smallest of shells cannot help but be eaten up by a neighbor, as he puts it, leading Goethe to conclude that everything that has become enters into balance with each other. Lepas polyceps achieves such holistic balance only through the most ruthless internal competition, in which some individual points claim as much property and space as they possibly can. By the essay's end, not only does each shell isolate itself from the surrounding world, but one observes Lepas polyceps qua whole, such that, quote, one then seems to see small worlds from tiny place to tiny place, potential worlds hindered from being actualized. Anything but one world unto itself, these aberrant barnacles are made up of many worlds, the whole thereby constituted, paradoxically achieving stability and unity only through an inner agon, in which each of its parts strives to become a world, a kind of whole of its own, at the expense of other parts. A balance is thus reached only insofar as the shell's individual strivings cancel each other out, as it were. The case of Lepas polyceps further underscores how the part-whole relation in morphological observation lies downstream from the more conceptually primary relation between structure and genesis. Wholes are only ever constituted in time, and as are their parts. And such processes occur in simultaneous interdependence with one another, for in the case of the animal, the whole is through its parts, the parts only intelligible through the idea of the whole. What is so unique about this barnacle and fixes Goethe's attention 
Is this the insight it discloses into the genetic processes through which even the failure of many parts, here shells or shell points, to develop into wholes, nonetheless leads to the emergence of a kind of second order whole? Visible traces of a stunted emergence, the main points of shell becoming, Hauptpunkte der Schallwerdung, empirically display remainders of a non-becoming, fixing the incipient moment of a passage out of possibility into existence or actuality, disclosing to the eye of the mind the modal threshold between potentiality and actuality itself a moment of incipient becoming. Given that this barnacle's unique kind of wholeness takes the form of an inner unity in strife between its parts, each shell point affords the possibility of observing a non-actualized possibility, of observing pars pro toto, that is, the very instant of the whole's antagonistic emergence as reflected in the striving to become actual of a part. Goethe concludes, if one were lucky enough to observe these creatures microscopically at the moment when the end of the tube expands and the shell begins to form, you would be treated to one of the most marvelous spectacles, eins der herrlichsten Schauspiele a friend of nature could wish for. The word here has the sense of a theatrical play as well as spectacle. If the animal is a world unto itself, then this barnacle forms a world of many mutually competing worlds. The natural abnormality aestheticized into a play so worth seeing that Goethe is willing to put aside his usual distrust of scientific instruments in order to occupy a microscopic front row seat. If part-whole relations may serve as methodological tools, heuristically to frame vital phenomena, then what ensures that the morphological observer does not simply project wholeness onto the organism in question, taking an apparent organic aggregate, such as the Lepas polyceps barnacle, as an aesthetic whole, as a schauspiel or theatrical play, as Goethe called it. A remark from the historical section of the later Doctrine of Colors articulates the difficulty and bites the bullet. Since in knowledge, as well as in reflection, no whole can be brought together, because the former knowledge lacks interiority, the latter reflection exteriority, we must necessarily think of science as art if we expect any kind of wholeness from it. And we must not look for this in the general, in the exuberant, but just as art itself, as such, always presents itself completely, wholly, in each individual work of art, so science, as such, as a whole, should also prove itself completely, wholly, in each individual subject matter. Science needs an aesthetic perspective in order to achieve some sort of unity between the inner and the outer, the first personal and the recalcitrance of the real. Goethe here acknowledges the necessary proximity of natural science and art at the same time that he calls attention to the impossibility of ever conflating the two. To do so would fabricate a projected or imposed form of wholeness in the general. To take science as art instead implies that the morphological observer must reflexively apply her own methodological tools to morphological observation itself i.e. heuristically framing a scientific investigation of putative wholes itself as a whole. This liberates the morphological observer to operate at a distinct scale of observation and bracket out the others by allowing one scale of organizational analysis to stand for the rest, completely or holistically in every individual, as Goethe twice repeats. Goethe did just this when he considered the Lepas polyceps barnacle, to be a whole itself made up of many small worlds. This should not be taken to imply that morphological observation imposes a holistic structure onto nature that is not actually there. Rather, the wholeness of nature in toto functions as a kind of regulative maxim that underwrites other forms of micro wholeness at different scales of observation. The formal scalability of wholeness allows the morphological observer to contemplate a whole on a given scale 
as a part within a greater higher order scale, or alternatively to contemplate a part at a lower scale as itself a whole when seen from an even lower scale. As Goethe puts this issue of scales in, of observation as heuristically co-constitutive of the part-whole distinction, it is not so easy to appropriate the great, super-colossal character of nature, for we have not pure magnifying glasses as we have lenses to perceive the infinitely small. And there, one must still have eyes. But since nature is always the same in the largest as in the smallest, and every cloudy disk represents the beautiful blue, as well as the whole world's cloudy atmosphere, I find it advisable to be attentive to the specimens, Musterstücke, and to place them before us. Here now the monstrous or colossal is not diminished, verkleinert, but in miniature, im kleinen, and just as incomprehensible as the infinite. An article of Goethean faith, the constancy of nature, always the same in the largest as in the smallest, assures here that methodological toggles between different scales of observation take place within a sort of vertical continuum. In particular, observation remains grounded in objective phenomena via specimens, exemplary of lawful regularities operative at a greater scale even at work in holes so expansive they are unfathomable. Key here is that such natural exemplars themselves exemplify a certain non-exemplifiability present at a greater scale. Morphological observation thus does not turn a blind eye toward the empirical non-observability of the meta-hole of nature, but operationally preserves the blind spot on a microcosmic scale in a concrete object specimen, not diminished, but in miniature, and just as incomprehensible as in the infinite. Goethe found such exemplars in Lepas Polyceps and the Paduan Palm, concluding his brilliant essay with an invocation of how this barnacle enables the observer to catapult past intermediary observational scales to reach human and even divine levels of nature. Since, according to my way of researching, knowing, and enjoying, I am only allowed to adhere to symbols these barnacles belong to the sanctuaries which always stand before me like fetishes, and through their strange structure sensually visualize the nature that strives for the unregulated, always regulates itself, and is thus in the smallest as in the largest quite god and human-like. Goethe's term for the kind of natural exemplar that enables the morphologist's simultaneous occupation of two disparate yet ultimately connected observational scales is symbol. At the same time, such symbols are only ever encountered when embodied in idiosyncratically selected concrete material specimens, scientific fetishes. Such methodological jumps in scale are dependent on the operational preservation of the non-observable at the heart of the observed. The strange structure of this inwardly striving barnacle paradoxically manages to exemplify an otherwise non-exemplifiable wholeness regulative throughout nature, insofar as it sensuously renders present how nature is governed by a transgressive striving for irregularity, for exuberant self-multiplication and aesthetic de-instrumentalization, only to finally regulate itself and reach some at least provisionally stable formation. The memorial function of the Padua palm fetish, as well as the epistemological function of the proliferated rose as an exemplarily exceptional deviation, thus come together in Goethe's agonistic barnacle specimen. To frame a vital, even inorganic phenomenon as a whole, may hence disclose an intuition of an actual ontological whole, or it may simply allow science to proceed in a surveyable fashion, taking its own inquiry as a whole. In any case, the serene contemplative standpoint of theoria, contemplation, must be just as much invented as discovered in modernity, and for Goethe this is not cause for despair, 
but an intellectual challenge. Perhaps for this reason, he said, that even a misfired experimental attempt has its own use, even charm. For the community of morphological observers, not settled or at home in any discipline, but dwelling in the interstices between them. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Daniel. Um, I know this is newer work, which is always a bit scary to share with people, and I, I found it exhilarating. So thank you for letting us in to this process and this new work. Um, I wasn't expecting to start here, but I think in the spirit of time, I'm going to get right to the thing that has haunted me. Listening to Goethe's elaboration and sort of account of the function of abnormality. Um, so as I was listening to the discussion of the proliferating rose, what was coming to mind for me was a very different account of abnormality, a much more contemporary one, one of the most haunting accounts of abnormalities in nature I've ever read, which is the nature writer Annie Dillard, which in the, time, in the, the book, For the Time Being, uh, she has an essay in which it begins by elaborating all of the birth defects that we see in humans. Um, and it's one of the more chilling accounts I've seen of kind of what she characterizes as natural evil because she's working in a sort of Judeo-Christian account. So it is in some, to some extent, it's a, it's a theodicy. She has to justify why these things exist, right? That's not Goethe's problem, but at the same time, he seems to, in your account, I think one might discern in his account a kind of airtight tautology where like, nature nature's best by exceeding its limits by exceeding its limits, it achieves a kind of different perfection. That aesthetic surplus is beautiful, therefore abnormality is always beautiful, right? There's almost this like, and so I'm wondering, does Goethe have any account in his aesthetic for horror or ugliness? And if so, like, how would we know it? Thank you, that's a great question. Absolutely. I spoke about positive misfits trying to valorize the abnormal. But there are instances in Goethe's natural scientific writings where he talks about monstrous creatures that are monstrous and horrible. Uh, one example I've dealt with is the three-toed sloth. And Goethe talks about the fact that fossils were being discovered by the naturalist Dalton and being reconstructed of these ancient, gigantic sloth species, some from South America, and their limbs annoyed him. They're so long, elongated. He tried to come up with an explanation for why the three-toed sloth was so abnormal in a negative sense. And um, he concluded that there must have been some whale that after a drought was forced to adapt to land. It's a kind of proto-Darwinian account. And the whale was too lazy. And as a result, its limbs overextended themselves. And the sloth is the way it is with its long, elongated limbs and skeletal structure because it is a slothful animal. And there's a kind of throwback to the pre-modern scientific imaginary of monstrous births having been monstrous because of a sin or a kind of moral lack. The sloth didn't try hard enough. He wasn't ambitious enough to adapt to land, and so he's abnormal. Another um, example dealt with by uh, a, a colleague, Eva Goylan, very brilliantly in a book that's only in German, unfortunately, is The uh, Rodents and Hamsters rodents, ham hamsters, live their entire life enthralled to a kind of senseless nim uh, nibbling. They, if they don't eat constantly, their teeth elongate and they become malformed, abnormal in, in form, in morphology. And um, you, re you can see in the hamster's behavior or the rodent's behavior with this incessant nibbling that um, you know, there's a heteronomy there. They're subjected to the need to perpetually bite in order to keep a good form. And um, so he definitely has 
weirder moments, even weirder than the ones I discussed, where he's quite negative about the abnormal, or at least ambivalent. What do you think suggests the rose? I think what, it, yes, I think what exempts the rose is that it's beautiful. And, you know, there's something about Goethe's natural science that is really more a phenomenology of nature than a science. And at the end of the day, there are these hidden axiological or value commitments that come to the form what for when he's discussing the bad, bad abnormality of the three-toed sloth or the rodent and the good abnormality of the rose. And it's hard to get behind the idea that the sloth was ugly and the rose is beautiful. And I think for Goethe, you can't really separate a kind of aesthetic evaluation from natural observation. They're intermingled, but it's not a matter of arbitrary idiosyncrasy. Well, I find the rose beautiful, and maybe you find the sloth beautiful, and we can agree to disagree. I like chocolate, you like vanilla. For him, Something about the fact that nature appears as beautiful to us testifies to the fact that it is our home. This comes up in Kant's third critique in a, in a footnote um, where Kant talks about the fact that beauty is so much as possible in our experience of nature is a kind of sign. Uh, he calls it the Gunst der Natur. It's a sign of the kind of gift of nature, that we inhabit a home that is for us. And there's a way in which in modernity, we've kind of lost that conception of nature. Um, nature is inextricably twined with our own technological endeavor. It's hard for us to see ourselves as embedded within this great whole that is unfathomable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I so appreciate that discussion, and I, I think alongside the, the aesthetic consideration of Goethe, I think we also have to reconcile with this other side, which is the fact that I, he does seem to be interested in a kind of lawfulness or a kind of order, such that even someone like Hegel in The Philosophy of Nature will say, you know, it's beginning with Goethe that we actually have a rationality to plant life. So I'm, I'm curious if, if these two Goethe's, the kind of aesthetically oriented, beauty oriented Goethe can be reconciled with the more rationalistic, lawful Goethe. Yeah, um, an another great question. The difficulty, speaking of Goethe in general, is um, Goethe is really a universe, and depending on which corner of his vast, vast works one occupies, you get a different Goethe. So I'm perfectly fine saying there's an idealist Goethe who disclosed the inner normative concept of the transcendental leaf. But there are also wackier Goethe's out there. I, I tried to present one today. If one were to talk about the sloth and the rodents, one would have a different Goethe. And it's hard to really unify any account into a monolithic worldview. Um, so, so yes, I mean, there is something interesting, too, in, in Goethe's just biographical relation to Hegel. Um, there's a humor to a lot of their correspondence. At one point, Goethe sent um, Hegel a no. Hegel sent Goethe a letter with two little glasses that reflect light in a particular way that was emblematic of Goethe's theory of colors. And uh, Goethe reply, and you know, Hegel said, "Ah, the absolute greets the Ur phenomenon, which the absolute was Hegel's pinnacle concept." And the Ur phenomenon was Goethe's pinnacle concept. And Goethe replies, oh, the Ur 
phenomenon is most grateful for the gift from the absolute. So you, you see them personifying their ultra-philosophical concepts as kind of witty um, interlocutors who don't take each other too seriously. So I think there's a, there's a kind of underlying humor in Hegel about the absolute and in Goethe about the or phenomenon that actually these concepts are supposed to be sl more slippery than they seem. And we're sort of in on a joke when we're speaking about the absolute or the or phenomenon. Um, more seriously, such philosophical concepts, you know, the rationality of plant life or the absolute, the or phenomenon, they're words that like coins or like a currency we can use to see something in common and to have a conversation. And in that sense, they're more heuristic and less kind of mystical, revelatory um, origin. Yeah. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2024, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.